Hi, Lasse. Thank you so much for the movie. Um, it was really wonderful. Um, to me, this short film is, is very dense and, um, and filled with all these layers of, of both autobiographical stuff and historical and surrealistic symbols and, and also this kind of ominous um, atmosphere connecting the present that we are in today with, with the past through a virus. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit of more about what was the necessity for you to make this film right now? Well, it was, um, you know, it was a little bit of a coincidence uh, because I was contacted uh, because of my Queer Geographies book, uh, if I wanted to, to do some uh, performance lecture. And um, at this time, I was just, uh, I think, as it was early spring and I was just fully paralyzed myself and um, and li a little bit of a news junkie as well. Uh, and I was kind of wondering why. I mean, I, first of all, I escaped New York. I was in the woods. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't have a compromised immune system. Uh, I wasn't older of age. So I wasn't really the risk group, so to speak. So I was kind of, uh, wondering why did it hit me so hard and um, and I came to the conclusion that uh, it came from earlier traumas that I had experienced and uh, and that earlier trauma is when I came to find my own place uh, in my own body and my own sexuality uh, that was still in the heights of the AIDS crisis. Um, and so it brought me back to that moment that when I was 16 years old uh, in the present. And uh, as we all know, you know, when we are young and we're still forming who we are supposed to be or become, uh, it's a very vulnerable uh, time. Uh, and, and certain things hasn't really been developed or described. So it really made me start to, to not making this to answer too long, but it made me start uh, uh, trying to write myself out of this. Okay, <laughs> so trying to write, write yourself out of the, the situation you were the, in. Yeah. The paralyzation, I mean, yeah. that, that I was just, uh, I, you know, why, why was I scared? Why was I reading the news constantly? Um, you know, why was I afraid of going outside the door? You know, what, what sort of experience did that uh, refer to? And so I was sort of trying to connect the dots and trying to write that text at the time when I was contacted. And so uh, by performing borders, um, so I was really trying to sort of um, understand better uh, my own reaction, so to speak. Mm, yeah. So some, somehow taking also more like a control of the situation instead of just ending in this paralyzed state, I think that we all kind of kind of ended in. Yeah, and, and that is hard, you know, it's 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 like I'm 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 using this reference about the knee, right? It's like mm. uh, I don't know if you ever hurt your knee but or you had a head concussion or something similar, is that when you first hurt your knee badly you will keep on hurting the same knee, not the other knee, but that particular knee, you will keep on hitting into all, all different kind of items and objects. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to sort of jumpstart or getting out of that uh, mode, so to speak. Mm. I was also wondering, like, because to me, it's you in the movie, in this, this short film, you have the feeling of this, um, <laughs> of all of this uh, historical luggage, your personal luggage, and then in one one minute inside of the film, in in the film, there is this mm -hmm. moment where um, I feel it's very ominous. I hope it's the right word. Where the sound is kind of like a siren, and and you see the bin binoculars, and it's black and white, and a man or a person in the forest, and you don't know if he's elevating or he's falling down the tree because of the use mm. of the reverse. And then the screen, the green text on the screen saying, uh, it's like my body warning me. And I got very, um, I don't know, very influenced actually by especially this sentence. And I was just wondering if you could tell a little bit 
more about this kind of warning or yeah yeah i mean it's 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 interesting with the body right because the body do have memories of uh, earlier traumas that we then uh, might forget or not and so is sort of stored in our bodies uh, and that's what bodies do and um and then then something happens that then bring that up to the surface again and and that's for me what this is about and then i was sort of using you know also you were sort of looking at the water fall we're going backwards in the beginning uh me falling down the tree i'm actually falling down okay, the tree. okay nice. it kind of hurts a lot actually i couldn't walk a lot after that uh, uh, it was not intentional but it happened okay uh, <laughs> and and so I was using this as sort of a metaphor for, you know, we have always this idea that things are going forward, that we're developing, you know, mm. uh, and, and sometimes it goes reverse. And, mm. and I wanted to sort of show that uh, in, a, in a level of imagery as well. Mm. So somehow there is an understanding of, of time as a linear moving forward, forward kind of thing mm. in our common understanding of the world but then in the you know the individual there is also the moving backwards through the traumas mm. and so on and also regarding um actually uh, regarding the traumas you were also talking about at some point in the movie like this individual trauma and now mm. we are living in this covid uh, covid 19 covid 19 situation as we say in danish um where fear or kind of cautiousness for this virus uh, controls a lot of our behavior, especially the social behavior now in Denmark. Uh, there has been a new press meeting and the prime minister, she has uh, put some, some new restrictions or advices um, to our lives. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about this with the individual traumas and then in relation to the collective traumas, because in this kind of, I guess also in the other virus situation you're talking about, the AIDS crisis, you can call it. Um, it's also something like something is happening on the individual level and of course something is happening happening in the collective as well. Mm. I mean, I, I don't think you can separate uh, necessarily the uh, collective and individual. Tra mm. I mean, it, it intermix, in, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fluid thing and... Mm. and uh, but I do think that we do carry different bodies and we do carry different experiences. And that's sort of also where some of the uh, displacement also happens. You know, it's, uh, um, I mean, as an example, I don't know how it is to walk uh, through as a woman uh, at Copenhagen at night. Let's take this night, coming night, you know, how does that feel? I don't know what it means to care if I was uh, in a black body, what would that mean and what disc discrimination would I experience? But I do know how it is to be in a queer body. And uh, I do know what it meant to be in a, in a gay boy's body when I was uh, 16. So, I mean, I, and these things, you know, overlap and sometimes don't. And sometimes people don't have uh, understanding for a certain experience. I mean, this is very current with the Black Lives Matter movement right now. A lot of people don't understand the level of discrimination that actually do happen. And I think that also happens to the, to the queer body. And I think what often connects the queer body is uh, an experience of trauma. Mm. Uh, and it's experience of uh, at some point in your life being discriminated. Uh, and that is what you carry along, uh, which is also uh, in the Queer Geographies book, there was this uh, great article by Camilla Trill, Eight Violences, uh, Eight Places of Violences in Copenhagen. Mm. And so she remember how she experienced as, as, a, as a gay woman, uh, uh, how she experienced violence different places in the city and how that would then make her uh, navigate the city differently. Mm. So somehow the, these traumas um, can connect a certain, like a certain reference of experiences. Like if you have, for maybe me as a, as a woman, I would 
connect maybe <laughs> well to the to the traumas that she is describing in the in this article, and that mm. kind of also makes it uh, maybe not a yeah you, what you were talking about both the individual trauma and then also you recognize it in the collective of this of this group that you are um, that you are sharing the the kind of trauma with somehow. And of, I mean, what they all these traumas have together is, of course, in the sense that it, it's often powerless places, right? Mm. It's like that's what often traumas are, mm. uh, or out of control, or you know, you're. Uh, but definitely, if it's in the realm of the social, it's often a, a powerless space mm. that you experience that you were powerless, and I guess some other had that power. Mm. But now, kind of the if we should talk about the COVID-19 situation as, as a mm. kind of a traumatic feeling, that is the social as being a trauma, uh, like stepping into the social sphere uh, somehow mm. uh, is, is an, can be an anxious feeling, right? Because, uh, because you, <laughs> you don't, it's so invisible, this virus. Um, mm. Yeah, and and so was HIV and AIDS. You mm. know, it was it, and so so what they have in common is that they really changed the the way we are social. Mm. Uh, you know, it changed how, particularly gay men, how they were social uh, in the eighties uh, and nineties, mm. uh, and even today. I mean, I think it really changed the uh, LGBTQ culture tremendously, actually. Mm. Uh, it just, and I think also it, it was not just a, a change in the LGBT community, it also changed uh, culture in general and, and how I believe that society at that time and point went from uh, a place where being less social, so to speak. Mm. And so what I'm now curious about is how, 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 uh, how is COVID going to mark people mm -hmm. uh, and how, what is the long term uh, so social and cultural uh, affects and effects mm -hmm. um, on, on people, you know, what, how is it going to change? How is it going to change the political? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we stopping, are we going to stop being social? Mm -hmm. I mean, it def definitely changed the gay men's behavior from being more promiscuous to be more uh, close circles or couple oriented. Uh, so I, it, it does change culture and I guess it maybe it's too early to see what the ramification is uh, when sometime hopefully COVID uh, does lift from our minds. Yeah, because I also, through the conversations we had, I was, I got very, mm. um, also a little bit before, but I got very conscious about, of course, your story with this, you're in the formation age, not there with your sexuality and and AIDS is a, a factor that you have to relate to. And now also with all the young people that I, as you also say, like, I, I don't know how it how it is, how it experienced to be a young person now. I only know how I, I appreciate being young and what I did and so on. And now with all these... Um, with the social being so, um, yeah, so troublesome somehow because of the COVID-19 situation, what kind of it will leave in their bodies um, when they grow up like you, right? Get hit by the past yeah. somehow. Yeah, and it does really leave its marks. I mean, uh, and it can be, you know, let me give you another example. One of my uh, friends uh, grew up in Lebanon mm. and uh, and as a child, and then in was it 2006? There was an air raid uh, on Lebanon, and suddenly she, she just her body remembered how to navigate in a city during a, 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 a war time situation. She would go very close to the buildings, not out on the street, and so forth. And she didn't remember that. That was just something that her body remembered. Mm. And so I think you know that's. That's also something that's what I also sort of try to say in the film that it's it still plays a role in in my you know social life and intimate choices 
uh, you know, like I'm saying, I'm still using condoms, with, mm. which is sometimes ridiculous, actually. But we still do that. And it's just we're the same generation and we have that fear built into us. Plus, we were my first sexual uh, sexual experiences was in the park and in the gay bathhouses. Mm. And I wouldn't say not to judge these places, but I wouldn't say that was a necessarily healthy community for me because it was a very anonymous, it was a very, you know, uh, non-communicative. It was a very, you know, people wouldn't always take care of each other. And to some degree, it was also a dangerous space, you know, mm -hmm. going into a park in the dark. I mean, there are gay bashing, there is uh, uh, violence. And, you know, uh, it was that, that sort of, initial experience and also always sort of always knowing that it was kind of gambling with my life I really didn't think I would grow old <laughs> and that kind of no no because you also this is also like I remember a theme in the movie like this with the desire mm. connected to this kind of death drive um, and of course mm. you can ascribe it to being young and the youth and you know like not thinking of course you will grow old or maybe that you won't die. That's the other part of it. Um, but I was also thinking like, do you see this kind of death, death drive now in the current situation if, you, if we kind of connect <laughs> the two um, you know, times where some kind of illness is taking over our behavior or, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of just went the other way. I mean, for a while, it didn't feel like having sex, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, and, and so uh, I was just trying to be over precautious to my body, you know, and, and because that's what my memory told me to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And and that was a necessary healthy thing to do. I mean, uh, it's not we shouldn't stop having sex you know but we should of course think about and a little bit like hiv and aids it's 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 not about your own health you also have things you have to think about the other person's health mm. um, and that was really also how the 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 aids crisis played out yeah but and i also played out is a really bad word <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> hmm. yeah yeah but it's now it's that um, but I was also thinking about this with the the body that remembers and also th this with the tra traumas you're talking or as mm. I I understand it in the science, people are talking about this epigenetics where they're talking a little bit about uh, how uh, things that you experience can change the way the DNA mm. or something like this um, and can be then inherited to the next generation. So how these traumas is not just an uh, individual thing, but actually can be um, a kind of a um, physiological and also generational thing. Uh, Absolute, absolutely, it's, it's very, I mean, these memories can become very archaic. I mean, it can go from generation to generation. If you look at uh, African-Americans here in this country, in the US, you know, there is a, a inheritance that comes with those traumas that still plays out in today's society, even though it's, it's several generations ago where, uh, where the initial atrocity happened. Um, so I do think that, you know, it is something that potentially can stay in our bodies and, 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 and uh, uh, you, know, sp uh, bec you know, go to the next. Mm. And how do you then like, because, did you, when you experienced it, were you aware that it was a very traumatic experience? And how, how, how do you deal with it now, kind of, to get out yeah, from it? I mean, it's, it was my reality. You know, you were just dealing with the reality of the time you were in. You were just trying to navigate, you know, having those two intersections for me to intersection of coming out, finding out my own sexuality, uh, crossing the, the the pandemic that that went around at the time, mm -hmm. and so it, it was like this kind of intersection, and um, it it definitely made it harder 
I would say uh, it made it much harder to to claim my identity, and it was. I think there was probably also a lot of shame that went with that uh, um, experience. And I think some of that shame I probably took into my own sexuality. Mm. And and now, like, because everybody, we don't know the future. We it's, it's kind of unknown what the consequences of this situation with the coronavirus would be. But but um, how do you? How do we? Because now we we have the feeling that it's. It can be traumatizing somehow. <laughs> I think the the awareness of it being a little bit uh, traumatizing experience is among mm. amongst us. And then on the other side, how to do how to deal with this trauma to get because that would initially be the goal maybe to get 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 the somehow not to have it. Maybe I don't know. Maybe not so deeply, you know, like as an auto reaction that can can kind of uh, break out if it gets like you're talking about the AIDS crisis and 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 it comes up to the surface again because of this crisis. Like how can how can we mm. m- not make sure but try to deal with well, it? I think, you know, the, sorry, the auto uh, reaction is not necessarily bad. It's no. it's. Uh, It's trying to uh, uh, save your body, try to protect yourself, you know. Mm. So, so I mean, that's also why, you know, people from the AIDS crisis say that the people that experience it are so much better prepared for for COVID-19 than people that didn't experience it. So, uh, um, but, you know, it's also... It's just interesting, right? Because it's like always it's about self-care and it's about... Um, You know, it's also finding the right uh, 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 the right the right level. You know, should you know, it's not healthy to isolate you totally, right? Mm. It's not. Uh, you have to sort of figure out how are you being social with how many. You know, uh, what what kind of risk are you willing to take? You know, how you know how many sexual partners or whatever, and. Uh, And you sort of have to sort of find a way to do that. And that's exactly what people had to do during the AIDS crisis as well. You know, people would have, I mean, maybe they would stay together in monogamy relationship or they would have a close circle of buddies they could uh, be together with or, you know, uh, there's there's different ways of... uh, It would also change sort of the sexual desires and fantasies and what you would do, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, maybe there would come like uh, there would at that time there would a uh, new thing like jerk jerk off clubs uh, appeared at the time, you know, because that was safe, um, where bathhouses wasn't that safe, you know. So it it that's also where it really do change culture and. It changed cultures in a much broader thing, I think, that we do think about. Hmm. I think it really going to change our cities. It is changing New York right now. I mean, people are leaving the city. People don't want to live in an apartment building with an elevator. They want to go to Brooklyn, living in a smaller house. You know, they, the, it's, it's definitely changing the whole landscape uh, that we are living in. Hmm. Definitely, and and somehow it's just like now. You look back, then you can kind of see the changes and uh, the ch- the changing, and also the AIDS crisis making the, the maybe the sexualities and the way of being together and having a uh, a gay sexuality and so on. Um, but also, yeah, what is the consequences of of the Corona cri- crisis, or what what would it bring of structural? Structural things. Um, yesterday, you were talking a little bit about this with the social, also like the social, the bigger, broader social um, uh, movements, especially in the U.S. With the, yeah, and you were concerned about that it would also change the uh, enthusiasm uh, towards that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean that's my fear, right? My yeah. fear is that that. 
when when I came to the U.S. the first time, I've been forth and back and other places in between. But when I came to first to the U.S. first time in two thousand two to live, uh, it was a, it was not a very social place, mm. and um, and something happened culturally with Occupy Wall Street with uh, different kind of social movements, uh, as Bernie Sanders, and you could talk about socialism, you could talk about collectivism. Um, and that sort of political shift has been so liberating in many ways and something that I was sort of seeking because I came from a Europe where, at least in the art field, it was a, it was a lot of collectivism, there was a lot of art groups. Uh, and and we could talk about aesthetics as social and so forth, and and uh, and so that shifted while I was in the U.S. And now I'm sort of, I'm sort of like, is this going to shift back? We're going to have a backlash, uh, you know, where it's going to be all about individualism. Um, I mean, it's it's it will be really hard to take for me. I mean, as, as a person and as a leftist, you know. <laughs> Yeah. It would be a really bad agenda. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a little scared of that, actually. Yeah. And I'm very aware of it. But Yeah, because it would be like, because you had the feeling from looking at American politics from the outside that, you, that it was going more towards a soci or like the socialistic uh, consciousness. The social was getting bigger. And that it would be kind of a, a big backlash if it, if, if it turned back or almost... Un un not understandable but um but yeah and i think it's it's global you know it's it's i mean you were mentioning you know how we're gonna have performances theater productions you know i'm making films you know how i mean also it's weird right it's like i'm in the i'm in the woods now i'm outside new york i mean i've been here since march more or less and and i was back in the city and it didn't feel comfortable you know it was like I don't want to be, I don't feel like being uh, that social. And I was in the city because I want to be social. Mm. <laughs> so it, it's even, even also a geographical thing to some, some extent. Yeah, it is kind of, uh, that is maybe what, what's coming. We don't know how the social will be after uh, when, the, when the pandemic is, is over somehow. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, to use a Danish expression, Ulkens Denmark, like periphery Denmark, will mm. not be periphery Denmark anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe people start moving moving out of the city. Mm. And it was, that's been the opposite trend for uh, for quite quite a while, right? Yeah. The last decade or so. But actually, a lot of people has become, younger people start to move out from the city, also to get more mm. space and, and so on. Um, but I was actually wondering about, because I've, found it very, um, another expression that you use in the film, just to go back to, to that, mm. um, this mind as gentrified. You say it at some point in the film, and mm. normally you think, think about the city as the gentrification, uh, like the, some kind of areas in the city becoming so look-alike that you cannot separate them from each other. Um, and then I was just wondering if you could talk more about this. The, like a mind that is gentrified. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of coil an expression from Sarah Schulman that wrote a book uh, called Gentrification of the Mind, and which is about uh, how uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic and crisis changed the city of New York. And uh, and it it literally also gentrified neighborhoods. You know, uh, people were dying, and uh, uh, other people were just waiting to sort of uh, enter the apartments. You know, there was no there was no collectivism in that. You know, it was very cynical, and 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 that's kind of the political climate you have now here is also very very cynical. I mean, it just feels like people are just waiting to get it, get those nice parquet floors of the neighbors. You know, it's it's. It changed the city tremendously. Uh, uh, also, who is living in the city? And I think that's changing now too. And also, people are dying. You know, it's it's very literal. I mean, it was the same in the AIDS crisis. It was a plague. People were dying. Uh, and you, just in New York, I mean, more than 30,000 people died. It's it's not just small numbers. This is a real thing. Mm. 
and in the end of the film, there is this kind of um, there is some kind of anger. Actually, I f I think it's uh, a little bit different than the rest. Oh, from from my reading or when I saw it, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the rest of the atmosphere in the film, and then there is this uh, thirty two million fucking birds later, um, some kind of aggression or anger, and I was also wondering about if you could talk a little bit about that. I think that anger really comes to the the current political situation here, uh, which is uh, everything but fucked up. You know, it's it's uh, who are the people uh, in the task force for dealing with COVID? You know, it's uh, it's uh, Mike Pence, uh, which has. Uh, a really uh, uh, problematic and dubious uh, uh, history of dealing with uh, HIV crisis in his own uh, state when he was governor, Indiana, and needle exchange. Is it? Uh, it is the CDC, which is uh, State and Serums Institute in Danish, uh, the director, which also have a, a, a problematic history with uh, HIV and AIDS. I mean, he was the head doctor at the time for. Uh, um, for the military and he, he made people take medicines that he kind of knew didn't work. And later on, he was the one that was uh, advocating for uh, uh, faith-based uh, uh, prevention in Africa. So, and these are the people that are in charge now. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's just, it's just doomed basically. Yeah. It's How can you trust people with such a, a problematic uh, history? Mm. I think it sounds quite, uh, it, it, to me, unimaginable al almost that these people mm. are in the task force to cure, cure this virus, uh, the current virus, if the experience with them has been so <laughs> devastating. Uh, yeah, and let, let me just remind, you know, it, the, the, this started with, uh, in the very early 80s, with three uh, cases of pneumonia in hospitals in Los Angeles. You know, if the government then would have been interested in, in uh, solving this, but they didn't really care because it was segments uh, of the population that they didn't really care about. Uh, we could have been in a situation where we wouldn't have had more than 32 million people dead. I mean, this is the same with COVID now, if we would have had a president and a, a task force that would have taken it serious. Uh, the scientists talk about that instead of 200,000 dead, we would have had 100,000 dead. So, so, you know, it's mad, politics matters and the level of cynicism is mind blowing. Mm. Uh, maybe especially because I come from uh, Denmark with a social welfare system that that at least when I grew up took care of of, of each other. I mean that is also changing and the whole mm. problematic uh, conversation in itself. <laughs> it's true, but I I was also wondering like because it's like the cynicism also you're talking about this with the AIDS crisis, people dying, people being kind of grabbing, waiting in line, grabbing apartments like the gentrification and so on. Mm. And also the social on the other side. Um, mm. And now how is the experience like, is both both the race of the social now in the COVID crisis, of course, it cannot be like maybe the physical social, but somehow another kind of solidarity. And then on the other side, also a rise in cynicism, or is it like, um, only a rise in cynicism or, uh, you know, like... Well, I mean, it's, it's very polarized, uh, especially here. I mean, it's like people, you know, get into fights because they are wearing masks or they're not wearing masks. You know, it's uh, all depending on geography where you are. Um, so I don't know what... I always sort of hope politically that there is a pendula, you know, when it really turns into the right, it's going to turn much more to the left. I hope that's the case in November, but, mm. uh, you know, I would have hoped for more left wing <laughs> politicians, but, you know, we're, I guess we're doing our best. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's also a special situation standing in this, both the pandemic crisis and then also going to this election where there are so much uh, difference between the, between the, 
the two candidates kind of the worldview on humans and the and how society yeah and then be. then in in reality just like the apartments i mean what this is about is uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor i mean the, the wealth transfer that have had happened with the governments uh, where they they put their uh, money is incredible i mean uh, People don't understand what the stock market is doing well. Well, that's because the government have been bailing out stock markets while they don't pay unemployment benefit anymore. You know, that's that's the reality we live in. Yeah, so crazy. But actually, thank you now for talking. Now we came very wide from the personal level yeah, to sorry. the I, I big mean, political. If I, if I but but I, it's <laughs> lovely for me. There is some nice questions also from uh, the people that have been watching. And I will just right. read them up uh, and then... We can see. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I wonder if the speakers could talk a little bit more about the metaphor of the bird, like if you can talk a little bit more about the metaphor of the bird and everything mm. we associate with it in terms of beauty. What is about the beauty in Fulen in the forest, which felt like the right metaphor of the performance lecture? Does it make? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, of course, it's different uh, levels here. I mean, one level is that um, the bird feeder were the boredom of COVID-19. I got a bird feeder and I put it up and I just saw all these amazing, I didn't know we had so many birds here. I mean, but like, I don't know, 25 different species coming and eating constantly. I mean, there was like a party there. But of course, for me, the bird feeder also represents sort of the hegemony of uh, a system, you know, that we all taking part of. That is like a capitalist system where we all are at the bird feeder uh, uh, paying our dues, you know. Um, and then for me, it's, it's I'm using the bird uh, because it's the other. And um, and for me, that represents that the gaze that we have that always plays into the, to how uh, uh, we are with each other, and and uh, we we talked about different bodies and uh, we talked about power, powerless spaces, and also for for a whole other sort of metaphor for me, Bert has this sort of uh, a very beautiful uh, other and uh, with this very, uh, but also very fragile body. And so for me, that sort of became a metaphor for how I feel sometimes it is to be uh, queer. Mm. That's, um, and actually this with the fragility, because the next question is, maybe the answer is obvious, but I would mm -hmm. love to hear more about beauty in the age of virus and vulnerability. Oof, that's a that's a that's a, a difficult question. I mean, sometimes you know, I mean, it is always a problem to aestheticize pain, <laughs> and uh, we know it from uh, 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 photos of the third world and people suffering mm. and things are aestheticized, and you can go to. Uh, a luxury hotel in Stockholm or anywhere, and it's filled with these photographs, and it's just sort of contemplating other people's pain in a weird sort of awkward way, you know? So um, that's sort of a, 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 a route I didn't really want to take. But for me, the images for me was more about creating uh, where my stories are very personal. I wanted to have the images to represent a more uh, structural uh, uh, story. Mm. So, you know, the, the water and the fluidity that becomes power, that then certain uh, poles are disconnected and, you know, who are part of the network and, you know, the bird feeder are sort of playing into that sort of uh, narrative. Mm. I don't really know if that answered the question, actually, but... Nah, you, they, have, they must write in the comment field if... Uh, oh, yeah, please come <laughs> back again. <laughs> Um, so this is the next question. As an immigrant living in Denmark, I would mm -hmm. be really interested to hear if there is a particular Danish cultural reference 
um, or a particular Danish queer experience in the work I might have missed? Wow. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. No. Uh, because I don't know what you have missed. Um, I would need some more information. I'm so sorry. Mm. Okay, we will... Uh... We but I think it's it's a, it's an interesting question because you know we read uh, with our cultural experiences, we read with the language we speak, you know, we read with uh, all these different kind of experiences and intersections. So, so sometimes you know, I'm sure. I mean, there are certain experiences that are very particular. I, w I was telling you the other day the story about. Because I, I was, uh, when I was young, I was uh, sort of in the reminiscence of the Gay Liberation Front, and this was just when you could uh, you could came civic gay marriage, and uh, we all we were a group of uh, guys taking dresses on, and then we went down to the most uh, uh, posh gay cafe, which at then time that time was called Sebastian, and we gave out divorce papers, and uh, man, people were angry at us, you know. We <laughs> so I mean, there is of course different experiences experiences uh, that that plays into to uh, how you see the world definitely so um, the next question is please may you explain a little more about how and why you portrayed your personal experience through the use of both the bird and the technology that was used how did this shape your work I mean, I'm, I'm very early on knew that how I wanted to, to structure the film. Um, and I mean, of course, it's on a technological level, I just uh, did more or less myself, except for sound. I needed help because I don't really good at sound. <laughs> but uh, but I was interested, like, like, like a post-structivist I am, I was interested, like I said earlier, to sort of bring in... Uh, uh, sort of meaning of, of both hegemony and capitalism and, you know, uh, who are inside or outside and the gays uh, and who are seeing and not seeing and uh, like me uh, closing my eyes when I'm seeing because it's what I'm seeing is something that, that goes towards the past and not literally something I'm seeing. So, so, uh, Many different levels I try to incorporate this. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, during the AIDS epidemic, sex was connected with fear, but people took risks and challenged fear. Does COVID 19 reactualize the same dilemmas, but on a much broader societal scale? I think so. I mean, uh, it really also depends who you are, and and if you feel that that you are at risk, you are, uh, you know, you're more devastated than if you don't feel you are in in a risk group. I mean, you see youth not really paying, at least in the news, you see a lot of youth not paying attention or you know, uh, partying and drinking, and and we know when alcohol and drugs goes in, you know. Um, <laughs> Social distance is not really an option. Um, but I do think it, it does play in, really. It plays, in, I mean, a lot of, I think even young people, a lot of people, I'm happy I'm not a teenager today uh, because just that responsibility that you, t your actions can possible have on others. I mean, if it's your parents or your friends or your grandparents, I mean, that that responsibility, if it's in a, it happens to go the wrong way, can devastate you for the rest of your life. Mm. And now, the last question is coming. <laughs> <laughs> can you, one. yeah, yeah, <laughs> can you <laughs> expand on the links between migration, birds, and viruses, transmission, on how element of border crossing, performing those borders has informed your piece? I, 
I, I have to uh, tell you that I actually did another film about uh, plants and migra my, migration because <laughs> we, we uh, often do think that uh, uh, plants uh, are something that's very rooted and, and, and still. And it's not true. I mean, plants are migrating in all different kind of ways. And I think in general, I think we all have to talk about uh, nature having agency and to some degree decolonize nature as well. Mm. Um, and I think that is sort of part of the approach that I take. Uh, and I think it just sort of comes automatical into uh, uh, the way I, I put things together in this film, probably. Mm. But um, I think we are at the end, actually, Lasse. Yeah. It went fast. I see Thank from, you so much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> from, from Emma that it... Uh, <laughs> but I think I would just end, because I, I really like this quotation from your... this uh, promotional material from your film, this uh, from mm -hmm. the Arund Hattie Roy, that the pandemic portal Arund, Arund Hattie Roy states is where our presence is erased and where only the past and the future can exist. And somehow, I, 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 for me, the film is very much there, somehow. Mm. And, uh, and, yeah. and just, she also says, like, you know, the, the pandemic, I mean, the, is an MRI of our society, right? It really exposes the society and where uh, the systems or the lack of collectivism or whatever mm. is, it really gets exposed. Mm -hmm. And I think potentially that could be a, 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 a good thing because then we know it's more obvious and yeah. hopefully the cynicism is not going to win. I think that's a really good place to end <laughs> the conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lasse, for both for the Thank film you, and uh, also for the talk. And also I just say thank to everybody who is uh, listening or watching um, this event that was hosted by... Uh, the fantastic uh, Warehouse Nine and also uh, Performing Borders and maybe one more organization. Mm. But thank you for tonight and take care. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>